All right. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, if you don't mind, before we get started. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I get, I wish I told these guys, I wish I would have been able to do this when I was your age. This is an incredible opportunity for you guys. So it's just a very um, interesting topic, and uh, I just didn't have this when I, so this, this is my opportunity now to be back in um, eighth grade and, mm -hmm. and think about this. I, I actually went to Taft Middle School. My brother teaches there. He teaches eighth grade middle school science over there. He coaches basketball. Um, you may, I don't know if you guys have ever played against Taft and seen this big, tall, um, skinny guy. Uh, that's my brother, Steve, and he teaches science over there. Have you guys played against him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, a, he's a good coach. He plays golf. I, I get a caddy for him in the last year with the, the U.S. Open sectionals because he's a pro-am golfer and he's a head coach over at Jefferson. Uh, so yeah, it's so it's so fun to be back here, you guys. I was here a few years ago. You weren't here yet, um, but I came here uh, and, and did many school assemblies. I went into the cafeteria talking about composting at the time, and I'm going to talk to Principal Latham again about trying to get that revived again for food waste um, collection. So anyway, um, don't want to get too off the beaten track here. Uh, thank you for telling me a little bit about your location. I noticed that none of you picked Iowa uh, uh, Cedar Rapids as your location for this, and I, I'm going to really kind of hone in on that because I, I'm here to challenge you guys a little bit and make you think about maybe some questions you haven't thought about economically, legally, politically, socially, uh, and, and agriculturally. Um, this is what I do for a living, and so I just get to throw a bunch of questions at the wall and see what sticks, see what doesn't stick. A lot of them you probably have already thought of, I hope. I'll be able to, you know, talk about some stuff you haven't. You know, what I do in my classes is not Q&A. I always do A and Q. I always end every class with questions because that's why we're here. We're here in school to be endless learners for the rest of our lives, always digging, 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 and never stopping learning. You're never going to stop learning. And so the essence for me of learning is eternal questions. I want you guys to leave here today going, oh, I didn't think about that. That's great. And then I'm going to come back tomorrow and ask some more questions. And then, you know, because I, mean, I used to think that everything revolved around the earth. Well, that was the answer then, and it was wrong. You know, uh, knowledge changes. That's the nature of nature is change. And that's what's so beautiful about being in school, is you get to just keep throwing your hand up and asking all kinds of crazy questions the rest of your life. I love that. So my organization is called, and I want to get back to this location thing in a second, because that, that really stuck out at me, that none of you picked you wanting to do this here, right here. And when I say here, I mean right here. You can do it right here on this campus. Why not? Well, I know that uh, climate is a big issue because you all you all picked climates that are in tropical zones that are you know pretty much 24/7, 365, you know heat. But I'm going to try to convince you that you don't have to necessarily go to that zone to do what you need to do for this project. I know a little bit about Future City, but not a lot. So I have to first start though by telling you about a little bit about my job and. Uh, I'm, I'm sponsored by New Pioneer Food Co-op. We're coming to town here in a few weeks. We've got a location that we're going to have up uh, off of Glass Road, the old Fit and Feather building. We're gonna, that's going to be our third location. We've got one in Coralville, one in Iowa City. I wrote a curriculum after the Peace Corps. I served in Africa in the Peace Corps in Senegal. That's on the extreme western coast of Africa, Senegal. We're here. There's the center. And uh, I... Um, was teaching gardening, got really, fell in love with it, came back to the States and wrote this curriculum called Soil Mates, which now has seven classes. It's gardening, soil science, composting, local foods, and life skills for at-risk kids, like when I go to Metro or Tate or something like that. Because I can teach, this is what I love about what I do. The garden is a natural classroom. I can teach math, science, literacy, history, all the core stuff <coughs> that you guys are learning here at Prairie Point. But I can also go out to the garden and teach you lessons about life that are really profound, like balance, respect, patience, nurturance, resilience, healthy choices, trust, listening, humility, gratitude. Those are my top ten. These are incredible life skills that you guys are learning beyond just growing food. I mean, I, I, I love to teach soil science. I'm doing it at Kirkwood right now, to, uh, tomorrow night, right across this, the thing here. But it's not just about soil for me. It's about life. And you know, my father passed away a couple years ago. Uh, he taught at Kirkwood, by the way. And when he, when he passed away, I had to teach a class like the next couple days after he died. And I was talking about all this dying garbage transforming into new life of compost for 
the new plants. And I just realized that with something as profound as your dad dying, I was able to see that you can't, you know, you can't destroy matter. You can only transform it into another uh, form. And so I was taking all this old stuff to help make new stuff. That's pretty. That's a pretty profound lesson right there. So um, I, I brought some pictures that are, you can't see too close, but I, I just wanted you to know that I, I do a lot of school gardens. I do 30. I, this last year we sponsored 33 different school gardens in the corridor, mainly in Iowa City, but now I'm in Cedar Rapids a lot more. Um, and I was just in Benton County, Iowa, to Jones, Tama, all the surrounding counties this last week doing school assemblies. And so it's, but I call it closing the food loop. It's not just growing food for here, but if I can't get it here, we're not throwing it in the garbage. We're transforming it into compost for the, the organic matter, for the next, for the nutrients, for the next cycle of, of, of uh, plants. So that's what I call closing the food loop. Zero waste, okay? Um, more than half of what we toss in the garbage every day, you guys, is a quarter food and a quarter paper. That to me is, well, first of all, it makes me really angry sometimes when I think about how much food we throw away with a lot of hungry people, A. That's why my first message is eat your food, don't throw it away. But if we can't eat it, let's at least compost it. And here in, here in this area, you can take it to the Lynn County Solid Waste Agency. I work there with Jason Evans, and they, they have one of the largest compost facilities in the country right there. Just 40 football feet. If you stand on top of Mount Trashmore, you can look down to the Cedar River and see just 40 windrows, a football field long, uh, cooking compost. It's incredible. Very incredible resource and priority we've, we've put on that, that in here in, in, in Cedar Rapids. So I, um, my whole message, though, is going back to, um, if you had to just remember one thing I'm going to say, it's this. If we don't, and I, I didn't bring it in because you can just imagine I'm holding some really good soil. It's a soil first message. If you don't take care of soil first, then we don't have plants. If you don't have plants, and by the way, all food comes from, from plants. You know, obviously you guys know that the meat had to eat first. What's the meat eating? What's the cow eating? Grass. What's the grass? The grain or grass? It's a plant. So soil, plants, food, us. Okay? And when I say take care of soil, I mean three very easy rules. A, just like there's things you guys can do to pollute your body, don't do that. Don't put stuff in your body that's going to hurt you. Don't put stuff in the soil that's going to hurt the soil. Make it balanced. You need a balanced diet to be healthy with fruits and vegetables and all the things you guys know in the five food groups. You also have to balance the soil when you get it tested. I just had my blood tested. for I'm, I'm 53 years old. I just had my physical. Luckily, I'm in good health. They test your blood for mainly two, two things you want to keep on track of, cholesterol and glucose. And I was, like, I was happy to know I'm in good shape. And I think a lot of it has to do with a balanced diet. I'm absolutely convinced of it, actually. And when you balance soil, you're adding more organic matter back into soil. Let's remember that soil is the heaviest part is sand, the lightest part are clay particles, and then in the middle, so it's almost half sand and half clay, but in the middle you've got this, this beautiful layer of organic matter of old plants breaking down. And let's remember this biology 101 lesson. If you guys, maybe, you know, you guys are pretty advanced students, you probably already know this, but let's remember, Biochem 101, it's the microbial, this is a long sentence, but go with me, microbial decomposition of organic matter that is yielding chemically available nutrients for roots to absorb by water molecules. So if you don't honor that process, and I just use the word availability, in chemistry you guys are going to know that just because the periodic table has 100 plus elements out there in nature, that doesn't mean they're in any useful or available form to get in that plant. And a lot of them are rocks that have to break down, like many minerals. Okay, So let's remember that we have to take care of that process to get to nutrients to get into the plant. And I'm setting all this up because it might sound like I'm not talking about Future City yet, but I have to set up some, this premise first before we can go any further. Um, uh, so when I say, oh, and the third rule is make it biologically robust. When you look at a microscope, you guys, you can take sterile soil that's just been like hard packed clay that's just been sprayed and abused and, you know, not, you know, it's a, it's a distinction between a regenerative system and an extractive system. In other words, if all I do is pull gas out of my gas tank and not ever put any back in, I run out of gas. If all I do is pull money out of my bank account, I run out of money. That's an extractive system. Pull, pull, pull. What I want you guys to think about is you need to put a little more back in than you take out. That's sustainability. 
And then when you re when you put compost or organic matter or more biology or more nutrients back into soil, every time you take something out with food, you got to put something back in to feed the biology, to feed the soil, to build organic matter. You're not building sand and you're not building clay, obviously. That was geology's gift of millennia, breaking rock up against rock to produce that component and that structure. But when you guys make a conscious effort to compost even, you're building OM. You're building organic matter. When you take a soil test, like a blood test, they'll come back with at least five test results. Macronutrients, you guys have all heard of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Micronutrients, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, boron, copper, zinc, manganese. Again, some of those were rocks. They test for pH. And remember the H in pH is hydrogen. Hydrogen has a positive charge. Clay has a negative charge. All these positive charges are drawn to and held on the surface area of clay and exchanged with the root. You guys, I hope you study, I hope you geek out sometime on soil because when you, when you look at under the microscope at this life I'm talking about where the root meets the soil and that door opens and closes, you can look, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff online right now you can Google and find soil scientists who will show you that living, breathing, hydrating organism of soil. It's either living or it's dying. And we gotta keep feeding it, man. We gotta keep, keep this thing alive. And when you put more biology with that, or with that decomposition of organic matter, it's bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, little anthropod shredder mites and springtails and all the stuff that you can see in the microscope, they are producing nutrients for, for roots to absorb into their body, okay? Um, so make it biologically active. Uh, those are, and so I'll, go, I'll get off that topic, but I want you to think about some assumptions. Two, question your assumptions here on this project. And let me throw out a few of them to have you think about. I already talked about soil testing. Oh, by the way, in the soil test beyond pH, they test for OM. They give you a test result back and they say, this is the percentage of your soil that's organic matter. And more often than not, in your soil test, they will tell you to add more OM back into your soil. More, I'm exaggerating to make a point, you guys, but more often than not, you need to put more organic matter back into your soil because it keeps, you keep draining it you got to build it back up. Um, I also want you guys to think about your water source. Um, you know, there's a lot of water in soil, yes, but and more organic matter you put in the soil, by the way, the more you can get through drought. Great, great research on when you build OM in your soil, you have more water molecules that are held in that sponge that when it's not raining and your soils get really dry, your plants are still able to access water because of the organic matter in your soil. But a water source in any food production, and my, mine, by the way, is man, mainly annual uh, vegetables. I do, in my school gardens, I mainly do annual vegetables, both above ground and below ground. So root crops like potatoes, above ground like tomatoes. Um, lots of flowers to attract pollinators and beneficials. You guys have got to put flowers around any project to draw in more biodiversity. And herbs do the same thing. So basil, oregano, thyme, rosemary, all those herb circles. I just use another word that I have to reference really quickly and let you know that biodiversity in your planning is going to be absolutely critical. If you don't have diversity in a system, I don't care if it's an ecosystem, my investment portfolio, my diet. Look, if I only invest in one thing, that's stupid. I have to, I have to spread my risk. Um, what if I only ate one thing? Equally idiotic. I have to put diversity in my diet. I've got to put diversity in my investments. I've got to put diversity in nature so that nature can balance out nature and, and let, let the ladybug eat the aphid, you know? That's the organic method, is you're letting nature take care of nature. And um, so I just would really encourage you to think about incorporating botanical biodiversity into when you want to grow your food. Absolutely critical. Most plants need to be pollinated that I grow. <laughs> Most plants need to have these little bees and butterflies um, that you guys have learned about since you were little kids. The pollination process is absolutely critical. And when you're in a greenhouse, that's a problem sometimes. I'm working with a greenhouse down in Washington County where they, they realize, oh, we got, this all, we got this closed system. We don't have any pollinators in here. 
So we can't do certain things. So think about some some plants, by the way, are self-pollinating. If you pick a certain hybrid, you can turn the seed packet around and read, you know, that they don't need that. But what I'm so so seed selection is going to be really important for you guys too. Um, there are all kinds of calculations in what types of seed to, to select. Um, heirlooms or hybrids, open pollinated versus, you know, not. And um, Materials. You guys are going to have, you know, I, I give away a grant to schools, and I would love to get you guys involved in this thing sometime. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very impatient person sometimes. Gardening is supposed to teach me patience, but all I want to do is run ahead and throw in all these gardens and grow, let's grow food. Why is that so controversial? Let's do it. But it is controversial. I just have to slow down sometimes because not only do I want to do a lot of gardens, I want to do the composting with you guys again too. I, I want to get this food waste collected in the kitchen and cafeteria and get it uh, composted. Baby steps, okay, patience. Um, and so the materials that I usually spend money on, because um, I'm not sure if you guys, do you guys have to crunch a budget? Do you actually have to produce a budget on a spreadsheet for this project? You know, where you're actually itemizing line by line what you're spending money on? No, they have you know, to give a general overview, overview of, of okay. taxes and how they're how they're going to pay for certain ideas. All right, but just a general overview. All right, it's kind of good that I don't know a lot about future cities rules and stuff because I'm coming at it just blind, just throwing this at the wall, and then you can take take whatever serves you and let the let, let the rest lay. Um, but uh, so I would just say that, for instance, when I'm when I'm um, spending money um, to grow food, I've usually got to bring in some. I got you know some uh, water uh, administration like soaker hoses, drip drip lines for irrigation, um, fencing, um, uh, soil amendments like lots of compost. Okay, I'm so, just so like the fencing and the drip line and those ideas though um, are things that you guys should be thinking about even in your physical model. Um, because the fencing serves a purpose, right? Yeah, I got to, in my, most of the around here, I got to keep the deer out, first of all. Um, I also I want, what I love about the greenhouse here is that, that's the last thing I was going to say is a lot of people are spending money that I'm giving them on season extensions. Not, I mean, what you guys built here is pretty, is way more expensive than what I do. I usually do little cold frames. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a little cold frame, but right now at Kirkwood Elementary, it's this cold outside, and we've got a little box with a window an old window on a box. You pull it up and you got fresh lettuce growing there all the way till Christmas or New Year's. It's because there's a lot of cold tolerant. And this gets back to the zone that you've selected. You've assumed that you want to go hot. I'm trying to convince you that you can probably do it. And in fact, if, you're going, if you want to really stay true to the spirit of local and urban, you might want to, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you obviously what you, I'm not, I don't mean to steer you away from what you've already selected for location. I just want to really have you Remember that we import most of our food into this ag state. We need to start growing more of it right here. Uh, and we can. And we have, we have a limited growing season, to be sure, April through October, March to November. But we don't preserve enough. We don't dehydrate enough that we grow in season. We don't freeze enough to take us through the winter. My grandma used to use a root cellar. We, don't, we haven't rediscovered eating in season. You know, we always assume, well, I, got, I need to have my strawberries on Christmas Eve. Well, why? Strawberries aren't growing here in, on Christmas Eve. Why do we want to import and ship all this food all the time? Um, I'm not saying don't eat strawberries on Christmas Eve. I'm just saying question your assumptions about why is it that we import 90% of our food in the ag state? It's just stunning to me. And the, the potential space, you know, you look at your school grounds here, you guys, um, an acre of land is like a football field. That's, that's nothing. But you can grow, I can grow enough food for almost this entire school on one acre. For all your, I mean, there's so much, you, if you guys punch in, you go to Google and you do a yield, yield calculator, you're going to find, if you select one of your vegetable or your protein, you can, you can go to these websites that you'll plug in. They have, already have the logarithm re ready for you to go. You plug in what you want to grow, you plug in your space, and it will tell you your yield on how many people to feed. Okay, so 50,000 people is this task for a future city, right? This like um, they get to choose the population of the Popula city. Okay. So, but most of them will choose anywhere between like 20,000 and. 100, All right. Well, that's totally doable right here 
Yeah. That makes it even, you know, when you, when you bring that, look, look, that, that number down, you can grow that right here at Prairie Point. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Uh, it's, it, it's incredible what you can grow in this space. Dave Swenson's an economist at Iowa State, I know. That's where I went to school. He, um, he just did, not just did, he did a study that was incredible a few years ago for local food. He, all he was doing was one, he was asking one question on his metric. He was saying, how much space would I need in Iowa to grow all the food that we currently import from California, Mexico, Florida, Texas, and Ontario? That's all he asked. And he was able to discover that in the space of one county, we have 99 counties in Iowa. In one county, he could grow all the food, and, and when I say food, I mean primarily fruits and vegetables, okay? Because in Iowa, we, 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 were the, we lead the country in egg production, pork, uh, cattle, that kind of stuff. And I'm talking about, <coughs> not identifying veg, that's my specialty is vegetables. We don't grow a lot of vegetables in Iowa. We used to. I just got a chart from the 19 10, from 1900 to 2000. In 1900 in Iowa, we grew about 50 different vegetables for export. And you look at this chart and it goes from from 1900 to 2000. It goes from like 50 things to corn and soybeans. That's not biodiversity. That's not smart. We put all our eggs in one basket. No, no pun intended, or maybe it is intended. But we have got to rediscover what it means to take this, this chart and go back to a time when we are growing more food. And again, when I'm defining food in my work, it's primarily veggies, plants, okay? Um, because, like I said at the very beginning, all of our food, meat or not, comes from honoring the plant. But you first honor the soil to get the plant, okay? I'm not going to beat a dead horse on that, but I can't say that, stress that enough. So, some more assumptions here. Yes, go ahead. So what was the answer? How much space do you oh, need? Oh, I'm sorry, work? one county. One county out of 99. That's you depressing. Can grow. It's incredible. <laughs> so just imagine taking, you know, there are some rural counties in Iowa. I was out in some of them the other day. I went to Jones. I went to Jones, Benton, Iowa, and Tama counties. And you guys, I was driving out in the sticks. Like, I went to Oxford Junction and in Jones County, and... It's a food desert. I went to get some lunch. I, I tried to find some lunch before class. There was no food to eat. It, it was like a Snickers bar at Dollar General. And I was like, I just assumed, oh, I'm just going to go into Oxford Junction and get a great lunch. No. No. So <laughs> you can take all of Jones County and, and grow all that food right there. And we're just, we're just wasting our resources. And we're, I think we're being... I think we're not thinking long term about, you know, we just assume that we're going to have all this food always coming from California. I don't make that assumption. I'm very thankful and grateful for food because I lived in Africa where people struggled every day to even get anything to eat. And then I come back to Iowa and I'm realizing, you know what, we got a lot of hungry people right here in Cedar Rapids too. I'm on the board of directors for the free lunch program down in Iowa City. We're feeding 150 people a day. They're lining up right now in the cold to get a free lunch. You know, I don't take food for granted at all. I want, that's why I want to grow more of it right here. I don't, I don't assume that it's always going to just be coming. You know, I don't need to scare you guys, but when you go home from school today, why do you assume you're going to open up the fridge and have food? I don't. You know, I, I, I really want to make it more sustainable right here. And for me, that definition of sustainability um, is really important because it honors this principle of uh, putting, more, putting more in than you take out. That's, if I had to define sustainability, it would be that. You know, give more than you take, okay? Otherwise, it's not a sustainable system in a finite Earth's resource. This is a one and done planet, you guys. We still have topsoil eroding off those row crops at 10, 10 tons an acre. We're, it's just bleeding away. Why? We gotta hang on to it, and we gotta build it, you know? And so, um, the yield calculator, like I say, you, um, you're you gonna have to do some num a number crunching on, first of all, why do you assume that when you select your vegetable and protein, did you do any market research to ask a produce manager, for instance, at High V, hey, what are people actually eating? Or are we just going to assume that we're just going to grow this and you're going to eat it? Just because I lead a horse to water doesn't mean it's going to drink. Just because I lead a community to vegetables, that don't mean they're going to eat the vegetables. Are you picking something that people actually want? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's another assumption I want you to think about. 
Municipal codes, let's talk about this. I'm an urban ag guy. I have a thing called the Urban Ag Advisory Group in Iowa City. No matter where I go, I look at the municipal code. Have you ever looked at the municipal code for Cedar Rapids? It's on the website. I want you to systematically think about going through that, that code and look at things that may be prohibited for edible landscaping in the city limits of, of, of where you're going. If you're going to go to Indonesia, they have totally different laws than Cedar Rapids, Iowa. If you're going to go to you know, Iowa City, we have totally different laws than Cedar Rapids. No matter where you go, I want you to think about the legal implications of what is prohibitive or what is incentivizing. In other words, are these codes encouraging you to do this? Because I'm telling you right now, in my experience, I've gone to certain places where they don't want, <laughs> they, don't, they, 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 they make it difficult, let's say. I won't say they don't want you to grow food, but they make you jump through a lot of hoops to actually be able to set up food production in an urban zoned area, zoned residential. Because we always think, oh, you gotta go be, you gotta be zoned ag. Well, the whole point of urban ag is to rezone the assumptions of the municipal code to allow people like me to take an acre or a football field and not only grow it there, but sell it there. And most of the zoning codes in almost anywhere you go from municipal to cities, they disallow you from selling what you grow, where you grow it. What, what sense does it make for me to grow all this food out here and then have to ship it off site to sell it? I want, I want people to be able to come here, s s spend less energy, and pick up their sweet corn right here at Prairie Point. So that's, that's a, this one little simple example of a zoning ordinance that needs to change, in my view. Okay? They, if you look at the zoning code of Cedar Rapids, they prohibit certain plants. I didn't even know this until I got into this line of work, and I'm like, why are you telling me that I can't grow that? Well, because it's an invasive. And I said, well, your definition of invasive is my definition of beneficial. I want more diversity. I want more bees. Well, we don't want bees. Uh, I do. No bees, no food. <laughs> I mean, I know that people, some people are allergic to bees, but that doesn't mean you ban the plants that pollinate food. It means you educate people about the proper uses of plants. You give me more EpiPens in garden clubs. So if a kid goes into shock, I, you know, in that rare example. In other words, there are legal ways to get around those, those pro prohibitions. The law. Everything is, is dynamic. Just because a law is in place doesn't mean it, it shouldn't change. We change laws here every day, and we should. That's what, again, going back to the nature of nature is change. Just because the city code says you can't do this, well, I'm going to raise my hand and say, yeah, but we want to do it. So let's change the law. And that goes to the heart of getting people like you eventually and me and uh, other interested adults to run for office <laughs> and it, you know, change the law. Run for school board, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, I want you to think about the, 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 the codes and ordinances of where you want to place this, this project. And um, you know, there's all kinds of gardening 101 considerations that I could go through. I don't think I'm going to do that today necessarily uh, because I have a class called Let's Eat that systematically goes through seed to harvest. And, but I want you guys to think about the fact that um, there are a lot of things involved in just basic veg vegetable gardening that if you don't have experience in it, you probably need to hire someone to help you or, or teach yourselves more about it. You don't just put a seed or, or a plant in the ground and then walk away. The most labor intensive part of the year for me is spring when we're getting the soil prepared we're getting the seeds in, the transplants in, the mulch applied, the fencing up, and then kind of kick back and play some defense and uh, maintain it throughout the season as you're harvesting and rotating, watering, monitoring pest conditions. Um, and again, your pest conditions are going to be balanced out more if you add more flowers to that because you're going to have one bug taking care of another bug. And I'm just telling you, I've learned from my experience here, hopefully it's worth something for you. And, um, and you know, little, little simple, oh, here's, here's one example of something that sometimes people don't think about. If I put in a row of carrots and I direct seed them, they all come up like this, all bunched together. You got to go back in that row and thin the row. One little simple gardening tip that sometimes people go, oh, yeah, I got to, now I have to go back in and thin those, that.
that row of, of what I've just put in. Um, so gardening 101, I want you guys to think about, you know, if you're going to grow some food, be it fish um, as a protein. And by the way, you know, I, I kind of quibble a little bit with the five food groups that the USDA has because I think a lot of them, for instance, you can get your protein from a vegetable, okay? They just assume that protein means meat too often because, they, because the meat industry wants to protect their interests. I understand that. There's a lot of meat lobbyists in Washington who want to have that uh, on the plate. When you look at the USDA plate, you've got fruits, vegetables, proteins, grains, and dairy. Those are the five. Well, a lot of people are allergic to dairy. Why is, but the dairy industry <laughs> is very powerful, so they want to keep the dairy on the plate. But, but you can get all that stuff from vegetables and fruit. You don't have, uh, you know, grains, we can quibble about, all I'm saying is we can quibble about those categories, those five groups. So I'm not going to tell you, I don't micromanage projects, I like, let you guys pick what you want to do, but I'm just, much, I'm just throwing some questions at the wall here to, to think about. So uh, I want you to think about also surplus um, collection and distribution. In other words, I'm going to throw out a, a concept here to you guys that, that uh, I'm going to take my phone out of my pocket because someone's buzzing me and it's annoying. Um, here's an idea that I'm gonna, it's so counterintuitive, you guys, but I want you to just think about this as I, as, I, as I share it. How about this? Because if I was a judge at Future City and you guys submitted something like this to me, I would say, wow, those kids have really thought about something that I don't think anybody else thought about. Here it is. How about this? How about grow nothing? <laughs> that sounds crazy, but let me tell you why I say that. If you guys had a component in your proposal where you really honored this whole idea of food waste management, you could go ahead and collect what is currently being thrown away in your own community. And if you had a, if you had a collection and, and, and of surplus system in place you, where you set up these, these networks with all of the institutions like grocery stores and restaurant chains and hospitals. When I say institution, I'm talking about these groups that really have a lot of food waste every day, um, where the dumpster is just full of perfectly good food. If you could find a way to salvage what is currently already being wasted, you'd save money on your project. You would I think, like I said, you know, as I was driving up here from Iowa City, I was like, wow, if, like I said, if I'm a judge in this contest and someone says, here's our vegetable protein, we're not growing any of it. We're just going to pick up what people are tossing in the garbage. If I'm a judge, I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Those kids really thought about something that uh, they said, is this growing even necessary? Why, we, why don't we just get, get, to what, get what's wasted? Um, there is, uh, I referenced marketing, like I said, doing some market research on what do people want. Um, are you guys selling this stuff or giving it away? Um, there's a whole retail, there's, in other words, if, you, if you're going to get into the business side of legal uh, implications on running a, a retail business, you're going to have to give a lot of licensing. Um, you're going to have to have health inspections. You're going to have to have liability insurance, tax implications. In other words, if you're setting up an LLC or whatever structure you want to have to actually, okay, we've grown our food. Now how do we get it to people's stomachs? Are we going to give it to them or are we going to sell it to them? Man, if you go down the sales route, you've opened up a whole can of worms that's, that's pretty complicated. That's, that's being a business. And maybe, uh, maybe, again, you've already thought about that. Because you're going to have to think about pricing, um, margin adjustments. Uh, in my line of work, cost maintenance and inventory control are just, you know, full-time job. Figuring out how to adjust those, those prices is, is a daily slog. Um, storage. Uh, most perishables, like vegetables and fruit, have to be stored in a, a cooler or a freezer. Um, some stuff, you know, depending on what you pick, doesn't have to have that same problem. If I do a lot of root crops like potatoes, I can harvest potatoes and let them sit in a cool, dry, dark place for months, and they're fine. So that saves money right there. Just you know, um, and you can get a lot of protein 
out of your root crops. When I say root crops, again, let me go through that list of above and below ground. I'm talking about potatoes, um, onions, carrots, beets, radishes, garlic, okay? Above ground, I'm talking your usual suspects, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, peas, stuff that's on a trellis. Um, just going through the, the, the seed catalog and go, go A to Z from asparagus to zucchini and just pick out, like, have you, have you, I hope you've done this. I hope you get a great seed catalog and just go, go, wow, I didn't think about that might be our vegetable. That might be our protein. Um, this is la more labor intensive. That's less labor intensive. <coughs> the above ground stuff, way more labor intensive. Believe me. If I'm taking care of stuff that's, that's uh, susceptible to the wind and the pests and stuff up here, that is more of a labor issue than in root crops. When I plant potatoes, I can kind of walk away from the potato patch all summer and come back when school starts. And you know, I'm exaggerating again to make a point, but root crops are less labor intensive. Okay, so think about that distinction when you're going through the seed catalog about storage. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Native American design of the uh, Three Sisters. You guys ever heard of Three Sisters? It's uh, you got. It. Sweet corn, you've got pole beans that are climbing the sweet corn as a natural trellis, and you've got squash at the base. So this is a way that they these are companion plants. The root systems are sharing biochemical information that are compatible to one another. You've got your protein, your vitamins. It's a Native American, and then they would plant fish fish, you know, in the waste in the soil to produce all the nitrogen and enzymes that, that uh, are absorbed into the plants. Uh, um, so when I do a when I do a vegetable garden project, I have a couple different uh, things. Well, I'll just show you the one that I like the most. This is called the sun spiral. So you can pretend that, that we're just out here and we've got whatever dimension you want. Um, and I've got a seating area in the center so people can gather. And the, I got these wedges coming off like a sun, okay? And one of these three sisters can be, this is a, this is going to be smaller, but it would be like over here. So this is south, east, north, west. Um, as the sun is coming up in the morning, you want all of your vegetables in the east because uh, they need, they're usually, smaller and they need immediate morning sunlight, greet the morning sun. So like if I've got a little, a little patch of spinach here, I obviously don't want a bunch of tall sweet corn crowding out the spinach because when the sun's coming up in the morning, I want the light to hit that, that vegetable patch right away. So this is, the, this is really important, guys, um, for the design of your city because some of you are just in the, they're just in the beginning process of laying out their city. Mm -hmm. So depending on what they grow, you have to think about where is north, where is east, where is west. Oh, this is the most critical one right here. Where does the sun come up in the morning? Am I facing east right here? I get turned around in the school all the time. I that's think north. That's north? Yeah. That's east? Okay, but let's just pretend for the sake of, you know, today, that I'm just going to keep east um, over here. That's north. Okay, yeah. I always, every time that's I come north. Into, East, yeah, okay. <coughs> that's east, okay. But, but let's I'm pretend this is too. east on the board here. As the sun comes up, I want um, all these little, there's little uh, vegetables. One of these is like the root crops. One of the, that, so that's uh, below, that's above. And then I've got some vegetables here called the, I'm sorry I'm such a scrawly writer, you guys. This, this one's come, running out of, um, hang on a sec. This one's got the vining crops. That's like the sprawling, I call them sprawlers. Like if I put pumpkins, melons, squash in a certain wedge, they just, they're not going to be in linear rows. They're going to sort of like wander all over the place, right? So that's, now um, also think about one of these beds, one of these wedges is um, just herbs. Again, basil, rosemary, thyme, oregano, chives, mint. Um, those are all critical components for, that's that word. Okay, cool. Now one bed is just for flowers. That's to attract all those pollinators and beneficials. And one bed back here is all the tall stuff. So in the northwest of a garden, I always want the tall stuff back here because they get the sun all day. They don't need to crowd on anybody. And that's the tall stuff like your sweet corn, um, 
Also, uh, anything that's on a trellis that has to climb, like cucumbers and peas. And I also like to put in um, grain. So you can have like one wedge out there with just like, uh, you know, um, wheat, buckwheat, uh, rye, all that kind of grain. Because grains get to be pretty tall too. And then I put one, one bed is just for compost. To teach people that, again, going back to my original theme, the only thing we're going to do in this bed, and by the way, these all rotate. So where I had, where I had the tomatoes in year one, I'm not going to put my tomatoes back in that same spot again. It's a fundamental tenet of gardening is you've got to rotate stuff. And remember where you put things last year because these pests will overwinter and they'll just stay there. You want to, you want to confuse them and have them move around. So you're rotating, but you're also just honoring the principle that one of these wedges is just going to be compost and cover crops where we're just going to take care of that soil all year, make it really awesome for next year. And then I have a windbreak. Most storms will blow in. When you look at a radar on the weather map, most storms are always blowing in from the northwest. So I always put a windbreak in of, of uh, fruit and nut trees. You know, people don't remember that in Iowa you can grow lots of nuts. We can grow hickory nuts, chestnuts. Um, I've even got a pecan tree <laughs> that's for this zone. Um, you know, um, hazelnuts. Hazelnuts are huge. You know, all kinds of great nut trees. And then the fruit trees, of course, apples, plums, pears. Um, there's even a cultivar of peach tree now you can grow in this zone. You know, we're getting hotter and hotter. When I, about 10 or 15 years ago, we were a whole zone colder than we are now, a decade later. So we can start growing. I even grew rice in my garden. Um, a dry, or it's called a dry rice that you don't have to keep in a marsh, you just keep it moist. So um, that's kind of a, something to think about for design. And then of course, like I said, you've you got to probably fence that in to keep out some of the, the larger predators and stuff. But um, indoors, oh, your greenhouse requires more energy use. I'm not used to this type of greenhouse. This is pretty high-end greenhouse from, from my experience. Um, it, it requires more energy inputs. I'm used to hoops where you just take uh, PVC piping and metal and put it over a, a hoop or a, a bed and then take plastic, it's four mil, it's like four milliliters plastic that has little tiny, and you can get it from a greenhouse or they can special order it for you. But you can even go to, I think, to like Menards maybe, they even have it in rolls. And you can get these rolls of plastic that have little tiny microscopic bubbles in it that trap the solar energy, even on a, even on a cold um, uh, cloud cast day like today in winter. There's enough solar energy coming through all this that gets stored in these little bubbles in this plastic that helps uh, hang on to the heat. And then you can select a cold tolerant species of plant to put in a hoop house this time of year. That, and you get all of your, your warmth just from the sun. Uh, instead of having to pump in a propane, uh, I'm not sure what you guys are, uh, what's the, how's it keeping warm out here now? Is it just a glass for the most part? Or it's, it has gas heat. It has gas heat. Yeah, so um, just there are several different designs. This one was just a different different kind. The, the other thing too, and we can, we might be able to, we will, I will go out there. I'm not sure how many of you guys will be able to join me, but I did take a, when I drove around before I parked, I did take a peek at it really quickly, and I noticed that it's um, connected to the concrete, not the soil. If it was up to me, I'd get all that concrete out of there. But that's just me. Um, I want everything to be connected to the soil because you guys are, you, you can't do any root crops in there. You can't do any potatoes in there. You know, you, you're limited. Um, that's just the way it was designed. But you could still, I would suggest that, and this may be a condition of the, the money that you got to do it, and, and it might be just prohibitive to do so. It would be kind of neat to do a control group where you're able to chunk out just a little section of concrete in there and get rid of it, and then start doing, you know, let's remember the frost line philosophy. Um, this time of year, the topsoil, all the water molecules are freezing. The topsoil frost line usually goes down about 15 to 18 inches before you get to 55 degrees constantly year-round. So today it's like 
20 degrees outside up here. When I go down any time, it could be 40 below out here today. And when I go down in the winter, typically 15 to 18 inches, I hit what's called the frost line, where all year round it's the same temperature, it's 55 degrees. That's where a lot of critters go dormant. They hang out till March and they're like, oh, I'm gonna go back up to the warm food source. <laughs> but they hang out. You know, a lot, of, a lot of stuff goes down and below the frost line. My red wigglers do that, for instance, in my vermiculture projects. And then they come back in March or April. Well, last year, the polar vortex, that frost line was not 15 inches deep. It was 50 inches deep. We had, we had, for the first time in decades, farmers who had never, and I talked to some old timers. These cats have been, they've been farming their whole life. They had never seen a frost line that deep where you get down to steam. One of my friends actually, this, I don't mean to be gross about this, but he, he dig, <laughs> he's a grave digger. I live next to a cemetery. My buddy Mike, he digs graves. Mm -hmm. He has to go out and, and dig graves in the winter. He said, Scotty, I had to go down five feet this year to hit steam. He said, I've been doing it, and he's older than me. He goes, I've never, I've never seen anything that deep. Because usually you only go down this deep. So the implications for dormancy cycles and what came back, what didn't make it back, nature kind of sorting out uh, that, that whole survival thing. Um, I'm just suggesting that if you, if you chunked out a little part of cement on the greenhouse, you could have a root cell. You could grow stuff in the soil, too. Um, you could take advantage of the, all the vertical space that you have in there with trays. I'll tell you, um, the one greenhouse that I have studied at is up in Milwaukee. One of my heroes for urban ag, is, his name's Will Allen. He's a former professional basketball player. If you go to growingpower.org, you're going to see my hero, Will Allen. Big guy, played basketball, came back. He was a farmer, farm boy, decided to go to Milwaukee, bought a big greenhouse. He has an urban farm right in downtown Milwaukee with goats and chickens and food and feeding thousands and thousands of people. Will Allen is my hero, and he taught me all this stuff about soil first. You go into his greenhouses, and he's got um, trays of greens growing in trays with uh, no soil. It's an aquaponic system. So in the bottom, you've got a tank of fish. This is really, now that you guys have select, selected fish, you might want to really get into aquaponics because um, you've got, he's got uh, these tanks of fish in the bottom. The only input into that system is you've got to feed the fish. The fish poop out their nutrients. The pump pumps all, those, the, all that fish waste up into trays above where all the root systems of the plants are getting all of their nutrients from the fish waste. So you feed the fish, the fish feed the plants, the plants clean the water. It's in this closed loop that's, that's both, he's got the fish below and the greens above. It's really awesome. I hope you guys get a chance to visit that, that sometime if you're ever in the Milwaukee area. It's really easy to find, I'm telling you. Just go to his website, go to growingpower.org. Um, incredible work. This man has done more with his time on this planet to heal people than I've ever worked with. Uh, so again, let's remember the distinction between outdoor production and indoor production. One's going to cost more money, or maybe not, depending on your inputs of, of energy. Uh, but, but take advantage of nature's free gift of energy. You know, when leaves fall from the sky in the winter, or in the fall, in autumn, nobody goes out in the forest and rakes up leaves. You know, that's nature's way of reproducing the nutrients for the next cycle of, of, of nutrient needs for the plants. Nobody goes into the redwood forest and sprinkles miracle Grow around the redwoods. <laughs> you know, nature's taking care of nature. You just have to honor those free gifts of what it's given us with the compost, the cover crops, the compost tea, the worm. You know, worms are nature's perfect soil builders. That's what they do. They build organic matter. That's their whole job. So you can have a whole vermiculture component. That's what Will does too. He's got in that same greenhouse. He's got he's he 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 he, he says, look, I'm not just growing food. I'm growing soil, because before I can grow food, I got to grow the soil. Then I can grow community. Okay, it's that whole progression again thing that I talked about from the very, very beginning. And um, let me think here. I'm gonna look at my notes. I. Uh, we talked about the food groups. We can go out to the greenhouse yeah, too. Yeah, I do have some notes I took on the greenhouse that we could talk about. I want us, I want us to think about these things. I already mentioned aquaponics. 
I want us to think about taking more advantage of the vertical space in there. Okay. I want us to think about um, the actual uh, plants that you can put in there. My, my top ones would be gr uh, green. When I say greens, I mean like your lettuces, spinach, chard, um, um, kale, bok choy, all the, the sort of like lettuces, lettuce categories. And herbs too. You can grow lots of herbs out there. When I worked on a farm, I worked on a farm for six years. We had a hoop house. We grew herbs in there year round with just that plastic thing I described. So you can grow, grow lots of those. But you can't do, sadly, you can't do any root crops. You could do some, some legumes. You know, you're going to get your protein from any bean. I would, I would highly, well, I'm not, again, I'm not going to, I don't want to um, prod too, too much on my selection, but uh, I want you to think about legumes, beans. Beans are an incredible nitrogen fixer in the soil. They provide you with your protein. Um, there's all kinds of awesome, I'm not just talking about green beans, like whole beans. I'm talking about all kinds of different types of beans you can, you can do. Of course, you need more space for that, too. So, um, I think I covered everything on here. And when he says you can't do roots, you can't do roots in the greenhouse, but you could do roots in your future city. Right. And one, one last urban ag thought um, before we wrap this up. And that goes back to Econ 101. I already talked about Biochem 101. Let's talk about Econ 101. When you guys study <coughs> if you have more of something, you can sell it for less, generally. This is generally true, okay? Volume and cost are directly a function of one another. So, one of the reasons why we import so much food, vegetables, into Iowa is because we're not producing enough of it to make it cost competitive with imports. So, the more, the more we can grow right here, the more affordable it will be to a wider variety of economic uh, abilities to pay for that that, that uh, thing that we produced, okay? I just want you to think about Econ 101, the, the direct link between volume and cost, okay? Woo! Thank you okay. so much for letting me uh, talk about all that stuff, you guys. Really, really proud of you. You had, yeah, you, know, you had a question too. You don't let the vertical farming stuff, could you get uh, the root plants in there? In vertical farming, well, you gotta be connected to the soil to do any root crops. Um, there probably are some research going on that I'm not aware of to grow, uh, you know, some potatoes where they're getting all of their nutrients in a, from, from a, a soluble, soilless mix. I'm sure there are. There are people trying to experiment on that all the time. But uh, I'm not aware of that. Um, but that's something you can research. And you had a question, too. No? Okay. You guys, I also have some free seeds. I have some free seed packets here that you guys can take. I, every year, if you've never been to Decorah, Iowa, Seed Savers Exchange, they have 20,000 different varieties of seeds in their catalog they, from all over the world. And um, they give me a bulk deal. This happens to be a kale mix of four different types of kale. Very cold tolerant. I have kale outside in the garden still hanging on. It's like, you know. But, but these are all, they put my logo on it, and you guys can take those home too for, for next year. <clears throat> Uh, we will use them in the greenhouse if you don't take, if you're not going to use them. I'm not sure how much I brought. Hey, we ordered all our seeds yeah, from the seed savers. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. For sure. Yep. The maintenance, I want you to really think hard about this. I mean, it's not necessarily a problem. Those are challenges. Those are opportunities, right? But you guys got to think about who is going to take care of this stuff. Like, I'm telling you, there's less labor, there's more labor. You can make it hard on yourself, you can make it easy on yourself. But you got to think about, you know, labor is half the cost of doing business. And you really need to think long and hard about, okay, we've picked this great, awesome stuff to do, but do we have the people to do it? And are they competent enough to do it? And will they commit to it? I've seen too many people just start something because everyone's excited, and I love the enthusiasm. And I don't, again, I don't like to micromanage people. I like them to make their own mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And I've had them come back to me and say, boy, we bit off way more than we could chew. Now we gotta scale it back. That's why I always say start small and get smaller. 
to just show yourself the first year, what can I handle? And I just want to throw that out there. And then next year you can keep expanding it. But that first out of the gate, make sure you've got the labor thing that you really thought long and hard about. Okay? So. It's probably not going to happen, but I would love to see just one of these pads gone. Uh -huh. So that you could connect part of this greenhouse directly to the soil. Now there is a drainage system I can see there that's, I'm not sure even how thick this pad is, but, but there's soil beneath here that I would love to see you guys have a little access to. And then like I said, you could connect trays that would, that would hang, well you've got hanging opportunities already right here, and you could hang a tray right here that would allow you to do stuff up here in these baskets beyond just ferns. You could do um, all your lettuces. You know, lettuces are cold tolerant. Most species of lettuce will grow, as long as you keep it above freezing in here, you can have fresh lettuce growing in here. So I consider greens, herbs, um, Again, my dream would be to chunk out part of this for soil access, but if that's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. Um, and what? you could also get a grant, hopefully, this would cost a little money, but you guys or some other future group of you, if Prairie Point could get a grant for uh, an aquaponics tank, I think up in, if you guys want to take, if you ever took a field trip to Central City High School up the road, they have an FFA program up there would be put in a, a, an aquaponics tank. Vinton High School, I'm just in Shellsburg, up the road from Shellsburg, Vinton FFA, put in a greenhouse too, you can visit. Um, there are other, a few other schools around here doing something similar, or taking advantage of this, and you know, you might wanna um, reach out to those folks and see the challenges that they had, how they overcame them, what they're actually growing year round. You know, you're gonna be able to in spring, not spring, I'm sorry, winter, in about, let's see, February, when you guys get back from Christmas break actually, you could already start starting to grow some stuff in here for next spring. All of your tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and herbs and stuff that need to start in the greenhouse. You could, you know, if it's gonna stay, what's the temp on that, 70? 72. Does that say 70? 72, 72. yeah. Wow, 72, you guys, it's like 20 degrees outside and it's 72 in here. And I would imagine that, that, that you, got, you guys are going to be able to regulate this to keep it at a temp, you know, that's going to provide, uh, oh, there's water access right here, right? Yep. Hopefully this won't freeze. If we get a real cold snap, I'm wondering if this might freeze up. Maybe we need to wrap that up. Um, I'm not sure how deep it goes, but... If it stays, if, it, if, it, if it's going to be this type temperature in here, that you're not going to have frozen pipes. But you know, I, I'd err on the side of caution. That. Uh, so who monitors this? You guys just come in and kind of tweak it. Well, that's where that's where we want to pick your brain and maybe connect with some of those other schools who are yeah. because it can't be. We're trying to figure out a management plan so that it's not one person's job or one team or, and how to organize that exactly. So this. This has a thermostat. Okay. Um, okay. To keep it at 72 all winter, you're going to be burning up a lot of, a lot of gas. You know. Um, so it might be interesting to play around with. I just love doing control groups where you you experiment with this temperature and see how that works, and then you know because you could go up higher, which I wouldn't suggest needing to do. I would actually suggest that you could get away with keeping the thermostat a lot lower than 72 in here right. and still be pretty successful with, with keeping stuff alive. Um, like I said, a lot of stuff only needs to stay above freezing, to tell you the truth. Uh, but then again, that assumes that you're connected more to the, the soil temperature as well. But, uh, you know, the, the exhaust, you can see the exa uh, that exhaust keeps, or the um, you know, keeps opening up and stuff. That's that's great because that's that's a naturally occurring effect of keeping the uh, that flow of air going through here. You know, got to keep the got to keep the air moving. Remember, oxygen has to flow up here, but oxygen has to flow in the soil too, or the soil gets anaerobic and dies. 
So you've got to have this constant cycle flowing. What do you think, let me throw this out there to you, to you guys, uh, do you think that it, this, this whole idea I have of trying to convince somebody to get access to the soil, is that, is that a wasted thought or could you, oh, here's another thought. Besides chunking up the soil or the cement, how about bringing in, how about bringing in, oh, I just thought of something I think I might work. You guys could go to the Lynn County Solid Waste Agency that I work at. Every May I do all the sixth grade field trips there. For free, and a ton at a time, you load up your pickup truck, you come over here with several tons, and that sounds like a lot, but a ton is not that much. You could build a little cold frame box, or a little a raised bed box, on one of these slabs, and put it full of really good organic matter, okay? And, and then you could grow some stuff. You know, most vegetables don't have really deep root systems. Most of them are only about you know, eight to 10 inches. There are some that go deeper, but you could, you could have a box in here that would have at least a little bit of what I'm talking about. Where you could grow some stuff on the ground. I, just, I want you to just take, maximize your space utilization here. You, know, you, you don't want to waste any space, and right now there's a lot of space that could be filled with plants that just sit in here and get heated, and you're not using it. So, if, if you threw down some uh, some soil on a, on a slab here, you know, Will Allen does that. He'll go into an urban um, ag project in Chicago or Milwaukee or these places, these urban blight areas where they're abandoned, vacant lots, and pretend that this was just a vacant lot. He would come in and just throw down a bunch of organic matter and start farming. He wouldn't even chunk the soil of the cement out. Uh, it's not ideal, but it still would be workable. And I think it might be worth your while to put some soil on the ground or someplace. So there are some plants that wouldn't be able to survive in here because of the lack of bugs or pollination? Well, it, unless they're a self-pollinating variety, they wouldn't, they wouldn't work in here. So that's why down in Washington County, they, they uh, had that problem this summer where they selected. And again, that's the learning opportunity. That's the teachable moment. They put in stuff that they realized, oh, Nothing is pollinating because we don't have pollinators. You know, you can you can introduce some pollinators into a greenhouse, um, but I don't know if you you know it depends on what you want to put in here. Um, you're never even a fly is a pollinator. Flies are annoying, but they they are also pollinators too. Bees, butterflies, of course, birds. You know, I don't know if you want birds fly. I would that would be actually kind of cool to have some birds flying around here, nesting. Um, but, you know, we, so get, get out of the mindset too, it doesn't have to be just botany, you could do some, you could do some, uh, for lack of a better word, livestock here, you could do some, definitely worms, Will always taught me worms are your livestock, you could do, um, gosh, it would, I'm just dreaming, yeah, I'm, yeah, a little, a little netted area of butterflies, oh, that would be so cool, um, a little tiny, okay, I'm just going to throw that out there and dream big. A little tiny chicken coop. <laughs> you guys, it would be so awesome to have a tiny, some, some chicken coops are so, like tiny and you can have just a few hens giving you eggs and some broiler meat. That would be a blast. They're legal in the city. Cedar Rapids was way ahead of Iowa City. You guys legalized urban chickens before we did. Um, so, any principal lady would let me bring in a goat. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> but look at all these cross beams that, that can hold a lot of weight. You know, if you fill up trays of, of soil up above our heads here, you'd have to find a way, of course, to water it. The water has to drain. You can't just have roots. Remember, roots can't just be sitting in muck. They have to. They they have to have everything has to have a drainage capacity. There you go. Now my arm is all wet. <laughs> yeah. Um, and gravity, gravity is your drainer. That's why anytime I do a garden, I always put it on a slight little slope. You never want to put a garden in a bowl, because when it rains, it's just going to sit there and muck, and that's when you get a lot of blight and fungal and just, you know, lots of blight problems when, when leaves are too wet and roots are too wet. Everything's got to drain. So your trays, if you put trays up here, you'd have them at a slight, slight angle so that when you did water them, 
the roots would absorb the water molecules, but everything then would still go down into a drainage system and then recycle that water, and bring it back up, you know, as long as it's not freezing. But I'd suggest, yeah, you could, you could get away with, uh, look, you guys, we've been in here for 10 minutes. It already went from 72 to 80 just because of our body heat. Wow. Check that out. That's awesome. Like at the Lynn County Solid Waste Agency, we have these big long thermometers that are like, seriously, like four feet long. And when, when you go up on the compost pile, it'll be like 60 degrees outside in the spring. And I'll plunge that thermometer into the core of the, the, the big windrow. And it goes from 60 to 150 in like 10 seconds. It goes because as organic matter is decomposing, it's releasing heat. So we're releasing heat right now. It already went up eight degrees in 10 minutes. That's awesome. So to heat your greenhouse, just have people Stand in Stand out here. <laughs> you know? Try to think of energy, energy that's free, is all I'm saying, instead of spending money. I just heard something kick off. That must have been the fan or the, what just, what just kicked off? Hot dog. Hot dog. The what? Hot dog? It, the brand name is Hot Dog. Oh, like here. Oh, down here. Oh, okay. oh my God. Yeah. Like hot dog. dog. Hot 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 dog. Well, I'm very, I'm very envious of this, you guys. If I, if I had this at home, I probably would be living in here. <laughs> I mean, this, room for this is so awesome. I'd be spending a lot of time in here in the winter, you guys. We probably should have been watering while we were out here. Yeah, listen, some of this stuff is... Uh, you know, you can always... I take my knife out every time I go out to a garden and everyone says, Oh, the, so the soil is dry. I'm like, well, wait, time out. Maybe it looks dry on top, and it is, but if you take a knife, like my, my pen knife here, and you go down, Look, it looks dry right here, of course, right? Some people look at the surface and they go, oh, it's dry, you gotta water. I'm like, no, not necessarily. Because the, the plants will tell you, they'll talk to you, they'll tell you when they're stressed. Right now, they're not stressed because it's dry here, but if I go just a little bit below, that's wet. So I went down this far on a knife and all the root systems are getting total access to water. You know, people overwater, typically, in my experience. You know, and when you water, you want to water a deep, deep soak. You don't just want to sprinkle it. You want one big, deep soak, and that deep soak can sometimes take you for almost two weeks, out, especially if we have a big rain outside. A good soaker rain means that I don't have to water the garden sometimes for almost two weeks. And I always want to monitor, when I see cracks in the garden, I go, yeah, it looks dry, and it's dry like that far. But then I get down below the crack, and I realize that the roots are just fine. They're getting. There are some edibles in here. We got some some herbs here. Some parsley. Got some basil. I saw, of course. Over there, that looks yeah. kind of wilty. Got some German chamomile. Most of what's out here are plants that people brought in from home for overwinter. Yeah, I'd say I'd say though that today someone should come out here and probably give give us a nice drink. Looks like. On some stuff, at least. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks again, you guys. Thank you so much.